Welcome to the Men's Health Mental Health Series brought to you by Migro, the emotional intelligence platform. In the first video of the series, we looked at psychological and mental fitness, what it is, and the fact that there's work to be done. Psychological, social, and mental fitness doesn't just happen. Much like physical fitness, it's something that's developed through techniques over time. In this video, we're going to be talking about the mental work that you need to do to improve your psychological fitness. In the March-April print edition of Men's Health, the feature article focused on male suicide and the importance of developing the inner resources to maintain an emotionally healthy life. So the stakes are high. And so we're going to be doing some mental exercises and some workout strategies in this video to take you through how to develop and do your inner work. So let's dive in and start moving towards greater levels of mental and emotional well-being. We're going to be discussing three key themes today. The first is we're going to start by doing a reality check. Then we're going to be looking at mental fitness and I'm going to give you a special kind of workout strategy that might be a little bit different to what you're used to. So starting with a reality check. So often we have these rosy expectations of our lives that this, we're going to just do A and B is going to happen, that we've got all these set ideas and dreams and goals and it's going to be this linear progression. You're going to be earning this salary by 25, have made this much money by 30, uh, this relationship goal and, and then often these hopes and dreams end up just coming crashing down because life inevitably doesn't go according to plan we don't get the promotion, the relationship turns out to not be as great as we thought it would be, or parenting turns out to be much harder than we expected. And life can leave us feeling defeated, like we need to give up, like we've been wronged in some way, or like we failed. But the reality is life looks a lot more like this. Huge highs, huge lows, a bit of a roller coaster in between. It takes a certain kind of resilience and mental fitness to endure this. We're unfit and often don't have the muscles to take the strain. But the key word is yet. So if your current coping mechanisms aren't working and you're feeling overwhelmed right now, you've come to the right place. Like I said, mental fitness, much like physical fitness, takes techniques over time. And I'm going to be giving you a few techniques to help you work through and establish the resilience required to navigate this roller coaster of life. So the truth is that getting mentally fitter takes work. Doing your inner work involves facing yourself. It involves looking in the mirror and seeing actually where do you need to grow? Where are your weaknesses? Where are your blind spots? It takes a lot of courage, time and effort to get to know yourself. Psychological fitness is described as a set of psychosocial skills, collectively known as emotional intelligence. The ability to effectively manage yourself and interact with others. Just like physical strength can be developed, emotional and mental strength can also be strengthened. So having discussed what the mental fitness is and that we really need to develop it, we're going to talk through now the workout strategy that I said I was going to give. Like I said, this workout strategy is not your typical kind. It's not your classic bicep curls or pull-ups. Uh, it's a different kind of mental workout strategy. The question I'm going to ask and hopefully answer is what can we do to develop mental fitness? It's one thing talking about it theoretically. It's a whole other thing actually practically applying that. And I've got three things that I'm going to focus on with you today. The first is to look in the mirror. We're going to be talking about self-awareness and how do we develop that. How do we actually start facing ourselves? The second is to watch your thoughts. We're going to be looking at an ABCDE technique, which is going to help you dispute any kind of irrational beliefs that you might have. And then the third is a gratitude practice, using a technique called the three good things. So to start off, we're going to look at self-awareness. Why do we start with self-awareness? Well, the fact of the matter is sometimes we don't really know where to begin. Uh, we might realize that uh, we have unhealthy coping mechanisms or be uncomfortable in some parts of our lives. But self-awareness is a fundamental key component uh, to beginning any kind of mental work or any kind of emotional journey. We need to know where we're at and we need to learn ourselves. So the step one is growing your self-awareness. 
Self-awareness is the ability to consciously reflect on one's thoughts, feelings, or emotions. Essentially, it's the skill of being able to look at yourself objectively, know what you are feeling and experiencing, and identify why this is happening. If that's all sounding a little bit overwhelming and theoretical, I'm about to get quite practical using a model called the Johari window. Introduced by Joseph Luft and Harry Ingham, that's where they get Joe and Harry, in 1955, the Johari window is a self-awareness tool. So what you'll see here is it's made up of four areas, the open area, the blind area, the hidden area, and the unknown area. So the whole point of the model is to start opening up your open area. And you do that by reducing the other three. Um, so the open area is what is known to yourself and known to others. The blind area is what is known to others but unknown to yourself. The hidden area is what is known to self but unknown to others. And then the unknown area is unknown to you and to others. And so like I said, the whole point of this model is to grow your self-awareness by opening up that open area and reducing the other three. And I have some key questions you can ask yourself to help do that. So like I said, the blind area is unknown to yourself but known to others. So a great way to start opening up this area is by spending time with others and asking them for feedback. Asking them questions like, what is a strength of mine that I might be unaware of? What is a weakness that you might know about me that I don't know? Or what are any blind spots that I might have? Reducing the hidden area can be done by disclosing, because this is what you know about yourself, but others don't necessarily know about you. A great way to do this is to share a dream or a goal that no one else knows about. Maybe tell someone about a strength of yours that perhaps they haven't heard of. Maybe you're really great at singing, but only the shower knows. Um, or you could share one thing that you would change about yourself and why. So there's some practical questions you can go and answer. And then the third area is the unknown area, which both you and others don't know about. A great way to start accessing your unknown area, where you might have hidden talents or things that I could be really useful to you but you're unaware of, uh, is to start trying out new things. So try out a new activity or a hobby, get out of your comfort zone, or go on a journey of self-discovery. So there's a summary of those questions, and I would really encourage you to go and answer these for yourselves um, after this video. So like I said, we're going to start with self-awareness. And once you've started answering some of these questions and looking at yourself using this matrix of the Johari window, the next step is to start looking at your thoughts. Now this statement here has really changed my life. You don't have to believe every thought you have. For some of you, that might be quite revolutionary because we like to think of ourselves as logical beings. And obviously every thought we have is true. Um, but upon greater analysis, you'll realize that a lot of human thought is very irrational. And um, we like to think that we're more rational than we really are. And so what we're going to do now is unpack some irrational beliefs uh, before looking at how we dispute them and overcome them. This has been really helpful in my life because so often I think that what I'm thinking is true. And then when you start applying this, you realize, actually, I often am having really irrational beliefs. So demanding this, catastrophizing, self-downing, globalizing, and low frustration tolerance are the four main types of irrational beliefs. And I'm going to unpack those for us a little bit now. So demanding this is having absolute requirements of yourself. It's living by really strong rules of should, musts, and have tos. Catastrophizing is making things far worse than they are. So it's taking isolated incidences and drawing very extreme conclusions from them. Self-downing and globalizing is when you're excessively critical of yourself or you take isolated incidents and make them far more pervasive than they usually are. So self-downing and then low frustration tolerance. This is when you believe that you can't get through something. Um, you just can't possibly endure it. It's too hard. Uh, so those are examples. Um, but I've got some more practical examples in the next slide here. So demanding this, uh, thoughts that could be demanding are I should have done better or I have to achieve this certain thing by this certain time. Um, very strong language around shoulds and have tos. Catastrophizing can look like taking an isolated incident like a mistake and turning it into a thought like I'm going to lose my job if so-and-so happens. 
or it's not worth doing if it's not perfect. So catastrophizing often goes hand in hand with quite an extreme perfectionism. Globalizing, an example there is saying things like, I'm the worst partner, or I'm a failure of a father. So it's taking something that was relatively small or minor and making it pervasive. And the fourth example there is low frustration tolerance. These are thoughts like, I can't take this anymore, or my life should be easy or comfortable, and so if it isn't, I can't do it. And, and that links a lot to that first slide that I showed you, our expectations of life, that it should be easy and smooth sailing. So there are some examples of irrational beliefs. And I'd really encourage you to go and have a look at how you might be able to relate to some of them. Maybe you have some demanding thoughts of yourself or some globalizing going on. And so take a moment and actually just try and engage with those and see if there's anything that you can relate to. I am going to unpack a more practical example now. Uh, so the ABCDE technique was uh, developed by a man named Albert Ellis. And it's a very useful technique for disputing irrational beliefs. So you'll see there that there's an A, B, C, D, and an E. The A stands for an activating event. This is anything that causes negative emotion or triggers um, a negative response in you. And the B is for your beliefs. And at this point, it's the irrational belief that is a result of the A, the activating event. Then C is the consequences. Uh, those are the feelings and actions that result from those irrational beliefs. The D there is for dispute. That's how you're going to overcome these irrational beliefs using various disputing techniques. And then the E is effective rational beliefs. That's the belief that you're going to replace the irrational belief with. A, B, C, D, E. Before I take you through a practical example, something that's important to point out about this technique is that we often believe um, the consequences, our feelings and our actions, are the result of the activating event. But what this technique shows you is that there's a buffer there and that your beliefs actually hugely impact the consequences. Uh, so sometimes something will happen, like we'll get cut off in traffic and we'll respond in a really aggressive way and we'll blame the activating event, being cut off in traffic, for the response. But what we don't realize is it's our belief about that activating event that causes the response in us. And so a key part of this technique is that we're going to be disputing the belief and not the consequences or the action. So a great example that I'm going to unpack that's common for many men is that of initiating sex. So the A is the activating event. And so let's take the fear of initiating a sex as the activating event. So the belief then, which is obviously irrational at this point, is that if I initiate sex, my partner's going to reject me. Um, they're going to think I want too much, think that I'm needy and that I can't keep it together. Um, and so the consequences are that you either self-isolate or you self-reject um, or you feel disconnected um, or you don't initiate sex or perhaps you do it in a sideline way by dropping comments, doing some kind of side banter to see if the person gets the hint. Um, and ultimately, you're left feeling disconnected from your partner. So the A, B, C there is quite evident. And what I'm going to do now is talk to you about how to effectively dispute those irrational beliefs. So the irrational belief I said was that your partner is going to reject you, that, you think, that they're going to think you're too much, think that you're needy, and that you can't keep it together. There are various ways to dispute this. Um, namely, evidence disputing, logical disputing, positive or practical disputing. Um, for the sake of time and not to overwhelm you, I'm just going to choose one form of disputing, which is evidence disputing. So what you need to do is take those irrational beliefs and provide evidence to prove that they're not logical and that they're irrational. So if we take the example of initiating sex and the belief that your partner is going to reject you, a great way to provide evidence for yourself that this isn't true is to think of all the times before that your partner hasn't rejected you. Think of examples where your partner's shown you love, where they've been warm towards you, where they've been excited and that you've initiated sex in some way, or that they've really been, um, that they've received you openly. So try and provide evidence for yourself to dispute that. Um, you can also perhaps think about ways in which this is unrealistic. Um, 
maybe even just small gestures that your partner's shown you during the day, that they've helped you with something or they've given you a phone call and that they've shown you love in other ways. And so why would they reject you now? So that's how you could potentially dispute those irrational beliefs. And then the next part of the process is to come up with an effective rational belief. Uh, so an example here would be that my partner is committed to me, they love me, and they want connection, closest, and intimacy, intimacy with me. Um, it's safe toward, to move towards my partner and initiate sex. So that is a really practical example of how to use this ABCDE technique in your life. Um, and maybe that isn't a fear of yours, and maybe the example isn't actually applicable to you, but I'd really encourage you to take some time and look at an activating event in your own life and try this technique. Um, perhaps it's a colleague that is very frustrating or irritating to you. Perhaps your child has done something that triggered you or your parent. Um, so take an activating event, look at the, the irrational beliefs that are underlying it, and try and dispute those using some effective and logical disputing. The third technique that I want to leave you with today is a basic gratitude practice called the three good things technique. Uh, this was developed by Martin Seligman who's known as the father of positive psychology and it's a very simple technique with very powerful results. And what it involves is asking yourself two questions. What is a good thing that has happened to me in the last day or so? And why is this possible? What made this possible? And you do it three times to get three good things. So I asked my husband to give me three good things um, so that I wasn't up making up examples for you. And so I'm going to give you his three good things and see if this will illustrate the point for you. So his first good thing was that he recent, we recently moved into our new apartment. Why? What made this possible? It was possible because of hard work, our salaries, and we exercised patience in finding the right place to stay. His second good thing was a weekly Friday morning meetup with some friends before work. This was possible because he prioritizes time with them, they are intentional and disciplined in their commitment to each other, and that they're great guys. And then the third good thing was an epic hike over the weekend on Table Mountain, uh, up the chain route on Cleve Corner, he needed to be very specific. Um, and this was possible because he knows the mountain well, he has a keen sense of adventure, and he loves being out in nature. And the group that he took up love a challenge. So that's an example of three good things that you could do in your own life. And this is a really great practice in fostering positivity, um, finding underlying positive emotions, and really just bringing gratitude into your day-to-day -day life. So that's a summary of the workout strategy that I have for you. Three techniques or exercises that you can do to really start doing your inner work and improving your mental fitness. If you'd like a guided approach to doing your inner work, Migro, the emotional intelligence platform, is a great place to start. We offer a comprehensive development journey that will take you from self-awareness right through to flexibility and give you the tools and the skills required to develop mental fitness. That's it from me. Like this video and subscribe to the Men's Health YouTube channel so that you can get the next video in the series. And catch me on LinkedIn at Christine Piaum. Together, Migro and Men's Health magazine are on a mission to develop an emotionally intelligent world. And we hope you'll join us.